Let me just put that up. started doing that. But we are on recording. So I'm going to share my screen online. You can also follow there on the screen. Um, we're going to continue. And um, I started three weeks ago saying that I'm going to spend some a little bit of time speaking on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit specifically over this time because of Pentecost. And, uh, um, and I do believe, and I've, I've said it, if you, from the research that was done in, by, I think it was Lifeway Ministries in America, um, about more than 50%, 56% of evangelicals believe the Holy Spirit is a force or an influence and not a personal being, which is very sad. And, and, and I do believe there are many things that we people are confused about, but when it comes to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, there's so much confusion. And I've said it also before that I think there's one thing I think, maybe I didn't, I didn't make this accusation. It's actually an Afrikaans Baptist church, Germany made this accusation. We actually said this, that Baptists do not talk about the Holy Spirit enough. So that's why I'm doing a bit of a, just a, 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 the third sermon now. You're more than welcome. I'll see if I can get these, all these sermons uploaded. On online if you missed the first two. The first sermon we spoke about the person of the Holy Spirit and his work. We continued last week looking at the Holy Spirit in the, the Old Testament and his work in the Old Testament. And today I want to continue talking about the Holy Spirit and Christ, his ministry to Christ, which is a very important topic. Um, James Bicheluk, I just want to tell you when I was in university, my first year I, I did quite well. My second year, I thought I was studying too hard. And then I learned the third year that if I get 52%, I study 2% too hard. So, I don't know. Do you have a social life, brother? <laughs> so, congratulations. We're so glad to have uh, all these geniuses in the church. <laughs> and, um, yes. Let's um, read together. I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 11. I know we're going to talk about Jesus and Holy Spirit, but I want to start by reading a scripture in Isaiah. Oh goodness, where's my sermon? Let me just open it. No. My sermon disappeared. Uh, let me see if I can get yeah, here it is. We'll read together in Isaiah chapter 11, only the first three, three verses. Isaiah 11 verse 1 says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see and or decide dis um, disputes by what his ears hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we come humbly before you this morning and ask Holy Spirit that you will guide us and teach us your wisdom. Help us, Lord, to understand. Help us, Lord, not only to understand, but to really seriously question our own lives and inspect our lives to see if we are aligned with your truth and your will for, our, for us. I pray for each one of us, those who are listening online, also those listening later on um, with the audio and YouTube channel, that they will, they will um, open their hearts, that you will open their hearts and their minds to see the truth of your word. And Lord, that my desire, and as I've been praying for the last two weeks as well, and uh, over the years, that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit and live spirit-filled lives as you planned and purposed for us. I pray that in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Now, just a just quick, as I said last week, we spent some time of the, um, looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and so and I showed you that being filled with the Holy Spirit was not a New Testament, just a New Testament teaching. We, we read from the Old Testament scriptures and saw that the Holy Spirit did fill P 
people in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. and um, there were different terms also being used, like he rested upon them, he came upon them, he also um, uh, was in them, and he rushed on them, and those are the terms we saw, but, but when we study the Holy Spirit in relation to man in the Old Testament, it's important that we fi we'll find that the Spirit only filled um, a selected few people. Not all believers were filled with the Spirit. Not every believer. And also, if you go to the Gospel of Luke, and I, I, I have a study on this, the Gospel of Luke in Acts, because Luke was the one writing about Acts, and he's the one, actually the only Gospel, that talks about being filled with the Spirit. Only a writer that uses the words in Greek for being filled with the Spirit. And, and then Paul uses the, one of the words only once, in, in, in Ephesians. But that's a different story. A different study. And I think we did it in the Bible study just when I came here in Open Baptist Church in 2018. But one day we'll do that again. Um, so if you go to the Gospel of John, you'll find that John the Baptist, for instance, was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. And you can continue reading, you'll find, and this is a very interesting story about Elizabeth in chapter 141. We read that when she greeted Mary, her baby leaped in her. Uh, I don't know if that is the same when, when a, um, a lady is pregnant and she can feel him moving, but I think this was a definite, not just a normal moving. The baby leaped in her, it says, and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Very interesting story. We read about Zacharias, verse 67. We read about Simeon in chapter 2, verse 25. And these people were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, before Pentecost, only a selected few people were filled with the Spirit. But more than that, I want to say that I do believe when, it, when we look at Jesus' own life, for me, he is the example, the example of what a spiritual person should look like. You can read John chapter 3, verse 34. It says, Jesus had the spirit without measure. Now, text today in Isaiah 11 clearly says that when Jesus comes, the Messiah, he will also have the spirit that will rest upon him. And the Holy Spirit work in him. We have here what is called the sevenfold, as we call it the, the, um, when we go to Revelation 4, verse 5, it talks about the seven spirits. And that's how we interpret that. It refers to uh, Isaiah 11. The talk, we, call, we call it the, the sevenfold of the Spirit of God. And um, he's the Spirit of the Lord. He's the Spirit of wisdom. He's the Spirit of understanding, of counsel of might, of knowledge, and of fear. All these aspects of the, of the work of the Spirit. And these attributes seems to indicate the fullness of the Spirit. Now, this passage also says that the Spirit of the Lord will shall rest upon Him. And this morning, I want to look at that. I'm going to go to what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and Christ. How the Holy Spirit relates to Christ. You know, Holy Spirit is the this, this, um, third person of the Trinity, and He is God, and we've looked at that in the first sermon. But how did the Holy Spirit relate to Christ on earth? When Jesus was walking on this world, on this earth, how did the Holy Spirit relate to Him through His life and through His ministry? Now, there are a few... Um, Clues. We can uh, another one in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 42. I think I've got it on the screen. No, I don't have Isaiah chapter 42, verse uh, 1 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, referring to the Messiah, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Now, Jesus claims this to be true of himself, 
if you go and read Matthew chapter 12, verse 18, he quotes Isaiah 42, verse 1, and he claims this to be of himself. And then we have Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2, where Jesus takes the scroll, he reads it, and then he puts it down and says, this is fulfilled in your presence. And um, let me read that. He, 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 read, he um, says this in, I don't have it on the screen. Sorry. Luke 4, verse 18. You can go and read it. Luke, Luke 4, verse, ch chapter 4, verse 18 to 21. He says, and he quotes Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery, um, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Verse 21 says, And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Interesting. So it's clear that the Holy Spirit is inseparable from the work of Christ. I would actually argue that from the Trinity point of view, the Holy Spirit and the Father works always, they always work together. But the Holy Spirit is inseparable when it comes to the work that Jesus did and the, the message he proclaimed and the miracles he did. And understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to Jesus I do believe will help us also to have a better understanding of who the person is of the Holy Spirit and how he works also in our lives. So let's look at that. I'm going to start with the first point, and that is the incarnation. That is also known as the conception of Christ. God became flesh. And I do believe he, well, I think this is in itself a supernatural act. God taking on the form of human flesh. And we learn from scriptures that the conception of Christ was a work of the Holy Spirit. The Virgin Mary fell pregnant. That was a work of of the Holy Spirit. Let's read together Matthew chapter 1. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, say that, betrothed, betrothed, to Joseph, married to Joseph, ESV, yeah, wedded to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to, uh, to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But he, as he considered these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So we clearly see the Holy Spirit doing a work in Mary, and she conceived a child. Now just for those who don't know, conception and birth is two different things. Or two different events. It's separated by nine months. <laughs> Did you know that? No. So when, yeah, I'm, I'm, my mind is going in a different direction now because people, when we when we celebrate the birth of Christ, we should actually celebrate the conception of Christ. That's when God became flesh. That's a very good argument for pro-abortion, ah, pro-life, against abortion. Anyways, different, different topic. But Luke describes, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, he describes this conception this way. He says, and the angel answered her, behold, this is Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You therefore, the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and empower you and overshadow you. We spoke about those terms in the Old Testament. We see the same thing there. So, so scriptures are clear that Jesus did not have a biological human father. This conception was the work of the Spirit. Now we know, if you go to, interesting, if you do a study in Hebrew, chapter 10, verse 5, it talks about God preparing a body for Christ. I would say it's the Trinity. God the Father preparing this body for Christ. In Hebrew chapter 2, 14, it says, Christ took on the flesh and blood by the act by an act of his own will. And the Holy Spirit was the one empowering my Mary and conceiving this child. Christ received the body the Father prepared for him by the Spirit. Did you get that? And just a note that Scripture never refers to the Holy Spirit as the Father of Jesus. That's a wrong understanding. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. He's the agent in bringing all of this into fulfillment. But He is not Jesus' Father. Now concerning Jesus' life here on earth, and we can continue to go through His life, and we see, I do believe if I study and I look at Jesus' life and His public ministry, that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, not at the Jordan, but from conception. I do believe that, and I can actually make a case for that. But our text in, that we read this morning actually makes that case when it says, Isaiah 11 verse 1, They shall come from... Uh, forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, referring to Jesus, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit shall rest upon him. I do believe that's from his birth, or from his That the Spirit will rest upon him. Now, um, so, we know definitely, if we go to Luke chapter 4, verse 1, that Jesus was full of the Spirit particularly when he was baptized. And also, if you go to John, ba John the Baptist, we saw that he was the forerunner of Jesus. And as the forerunner, he was filled with the Spirit from his womb. Why would Jesus not be? That's maybe an argument from silence. But it's just to say that why would Jesus, the Son of God, whom, whom, on whom the Holy Spirit will rest, not be filled from conception. In fact, John chapter 3, 35, which I mentioned earlier, says that he was given the Spirit not with measure. And there's no reason to assume that he was not filled. So Jesus grew up to be like a normal human being. In Luke 2 verse 40 and 452 says that he increased in wisdom and in stature. And when he was, you remember the story when he was in the temple, when he was 12 years old, his mother, Mary and Joseph, were looking for him for two days, I think. And they found him in the temple. It says that the people there were so amazed about his understanding and the way he answered them. So Jesus was, was far beyond what a 12-year-old would have understanding of when it comes to spiritual things. Why? Because I believe he was spiritful. And while Jesus was fully God, I do believe while he walked this earth, he was fully God and fully man. He never gave up his divinity when he became human. It is not clear that he's the, while he was fully God on earth, it is not clear that his divine attributes were manifested in this instance when he was in the temple. Uh, in Luke 4, of oh, Luke chapter 2. 
So Luke does not uh, do, does say that he increased in wisdom and in stature. He grew in the knowledge and men, can I say mental ability, just like a normal person would, would grow and his brain develops and he learns more. Jesus grew in knowledge, but isn't he God? Doesn't is he is he not omniscient? That's what I want to answer this morning. And I do believe that the Holy Spirit um, ministered to Jesus in his humanity, supplying him the knowledge and wisdom for where it was necessary. <laughs> Hebrew chapter 4, verse 50. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Is Jesus weak? But he's God. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In other words, Jesus can sympathize sympathize with you and me when it comes to our weakness because he also experienced weakness. He also experienced temptation. But how did he overcome temptation and weakness? What do you think? He was filled with the Spirit. Could he do that without the Spirit? Of course he could. He's God. But he chose not to. He chose to rely on the Spirit. Did he overcome because he, the sin with, because he was God? Certainly he could, but I believe he overcame because he was Spirit-filled. And that's a lesson to you, me. Now, now this text makes you think. Now read this and, and let this text sink in somewhere. I don't know why I missed this, but let, read it and... Let it sink in. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. Although he was a son, referring to Jesus, he learned obedience what, through what he suffered. Let that sink in. Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Is suffering bad for you? Not always. Jesus could obey because he was fully God. But that's not the reason he obeyed. He learned obedience to suffering. And I do believe that Jesus was sinless because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you want to overcome sin in your life? Are you struggling with something in your life? You want to overcome that? You know what the answer is? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now if you go to Jesus, the second point to his public ministry, referring to when he was baptized and he ministered, he was about three years old. I think. Jesus' public ministry began with his baptism in the Jordan River. And this event was like the induction of his messianic ministry. And on this occasion, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the form of a dove and abode on Christ. I can understand why people think he was filled with the Spirit then. But I think... This was just a specific, visible, public manifestation to show the beginning of his ministry. Now, first, I don't believe this event at Jordan was the beginning of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to Jesus. I believe it was simply an outward manifestation, a new phase of his ministry, the descent, the, the, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon Christ. Marking the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And from that moment on, the Spirit affected the outward signs that we saw from His, the, the outward signs of His Messiahship. 
And it is notable that the Trinity is also there when Jesus was baptized. The Father spoke, said, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. And then the Spirit descended in the form of a dove. And this reveals that everything that happens was the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working together in unity. Everything that happened. I would, I would, if I have my mind right, maybe you can correct me, I think the Father's will, the plan, they plan together, but the Father will it. Jesus said, I'll do it. And the Spirit said, I'll help you. Is that good theology? But they did it in unity. And Jesus ministered, and, and we can go through a few things, but Jesus ministered as a prophet. And he was dependent. Oh, but let, listen, God is omniscient. Jesus is omniscient. He could have said and teach and proclaim everything from his divinity. But he didn't. He was dependent on the Holy Spirit for exercising his prophetic office. He could have prophesied because he's fully God, but he did not. He relied on the Spirit. And I mentioned in the beginning of the sermon that Jesus quoted Isaiah um, 42. And let me read it again. It's Matthew 12. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations, to the Gentiles. Well, Isaiah says nations, but it's the same. He claimed this to be true of himself. And also Luke 4 that we read, 18, where he quotes Isaiah 61 and saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he anointed me to do what? To proclaim the good news. Could he do this on his own as God? Of course he could. But he didn't. The Spirit was on him and anointed him to do this. Jesus could have done this, but he chose to do this in the power of the Spirit. I believe he did so. Well, we can ask many questions why, but I believe he did so. Maybe this is my opinion. Rudy Driefers did so. But I believe he did so. So that we can have an example to follow. So that we can follow in his footsteps. <clears throat> and that's what Jesus promised in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When he says, "And but you will receive the power from um, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. Why do you need the power of the Spirit? Because I, I'm so shy. I can't talk about Jesus. Have you struggled with that in your life? To talk about Jesus. Is it difficult to talk to strangers about Jesus? Well, I've struggled sometimes, but I need the power of the Spirit to do that. To give me the right words, as he also said to the disciples, when you don't know what to say, I'll give you the words. The Spirit of God to give you the words to say. So it's important that we see that we need the power of the Spirit to be filled with the Spirit, just as Jesus did. Now question. Here's another question that probably many people will try to answer. And I'll do my best. But did Jesus perform miracles because of his divine nature or because of he, him being filled with the Spirit? That is understood. What do I think? I think if I study the scriptures, I believe that it's both. There's evidence for both. There are, at, there are at least some miracles that we know that he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. As Luke 4 says, he has anointed me to, to proclaim the good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind. Because of his anointing. But there are also texts 
that we read in Mark chapter 5, 30. I think it was the story about, I, I don't have this scripture here, where the woman touched his um, tunic <laughs> and he felt power from him going out. Remember that story? And we read in, in Luke chapter 5, 17, 6, chapter, uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 19, and chapter 8, verse 46, that power proceeded from Jesus and he healed people. So I think that's clear that Jesus, yes, he could perform miracles, healing people in his own power because of his divine nature. But he also performed miracles in the power of the Spirit. I think it's both true. Again, Luke 4, verse, and I quoted that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to pro and, uh, because he anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind. So in other words, Jesus gave sight to blind because the Spirit was upon him and anointed him. So I do believe Jesus did miracles because of he was both God and in the power of the Spirit. Now when it comes to the sufferings of Jesus, also interesting, Jesus relied on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit sustained him in his suffering. And this is also part of the ministry of the Spirit. After Jesus was driven by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. After he came out of the wilderness, it says the following in Luke 4 verse 14. It says, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. So in his weakness, he was filled with the Spirit of God. And he returned in the power of the Spirit. So I do believe there's spirit empowering to overcome temptations in the wilderness, but it was together with something else. Who wants to guess? How did Jesus overcome temptation? In the power of the Spirit and? The Word of God. Scriptures. Now there's another thing I want to add there. You can read that story where Jesus was tempted three times. And the second, he says, but the scripture says this and this. Yeah? And then the second, and the scripture also says, now that's a good practice when it comes to quoting scriptures. And it's not always, you, you can use one scripture out of context. But it's not about that one scripture. It's about what, and the scripture also says. And the scripture also says. Scripture complementing scripture. It's a good, good thing to do when you interpret scripture. Okay. We also know, and this is interesting, that Jesus offered himself by the Spirit to die. You know that? I can just imagine as a human being how it must feel to know that you have a purpose and plan. You must die for the whole world. And the sin of the whole world will be put on your shoulders. And you need to take the punishment of that. God's wrath. You need to take the punishment. And I do believe he did, that, did, did it by the power of the Spirit. Hebrew chapter 9, 14 says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself. Through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus offered himself through the eternal spirit. And there's another scripture just proving that the Holy Spirit is God because only God is eternal. And here it says eternal spirit. Okay, just another scripture that proves that. And I believe that the Holy Spirit ministered to him in these last 
difficult hours of his life in Gethsemane until the moments leading up to the cross. I do believe the Spirit ministered to Jesus in his weakness, offering himself. And all of this is important. Why? Because it's important for us. Because we learn that that is what the work of the Spirit do in our lives. He empowers us not only for ministry, but He also strengthens us and, for, um, and gives us the ability to overcome sin in your life. And He's also there in our weakness. That's why you need to be filled with the Spirit. Paul says, Galatians 5 verse 6, and this is about overcoming sin. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. My brother, my sister, if you struggle with sin in your life, you need to walk by the Spirit. And He gives us new life. The Spirit gives us regeneration. He gives us new life. But not only that, He guarantees our eternal salvation. He's the guarantee, the seal, Ephesians 1. He sustains our spiritual life. And He also aids us in our weakness, weaknesses, in our weakest moments. The third point, and I'm going to make this one a short one, but the resurrection of Jesus. In Acts 2 verse 24, Peter said, God raised Jesus from the dead. He says, God raised Jesus from the dead. And then Paul comes in Romans 8 verse 11. He says, it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I believe it was all three. Jesus said, I lay my life down and I will take it up. But let me read Romans 8, 11, because this is important for you and me. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Isn't that comforting? Knowing that when the spirit lives in me, Sickness, disease, death can come. This mortal body will be raised into new life. So comforting. And from this text we learn the Spirit is the agent of resurrection. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ was quickened by the Spirit. And I believe the office of the Spirit is one of creation. One of recreation, that's being born again. Because John 3 teaches us that we are born of the Spirit. And one of resurrection. <clears throat> he gives life. So if the Holy Spirit is in us, we are guaranteed a resurrection. Now mortal bodies will be raised. And that's just a wonderful promise for each of the children of God. It is for this reason that Paul writes the words in Ephesians 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. What a wonderful promise to you and me as believers. Can I say it again? And I said it last week. You need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. He's the helper. He's the comforter. We spoke about those things. We need Him. And if you are saved, you already have the indwelling of the Spirit. But you must be filled with the Spirit. Was my hand screen? Ach nee, ek het een voorbeeld. Dat ek wil wees. Was hy? Who's got a glove? Ek het nie koud. Is dit een klein vir my? 
Y ahí tico. Let me show you this. This, this made sense to me many years ago. I think I'm not here. Share on YouTube. You stand there. Social distance. Okay, I don't know if the people are online going to see. I'll turn the screen. Just put your fist into the glove, not your fingers, your fist. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. Your fist. But now you must be filled with the Spirit. Now fill your fingers in you. That's being filled with the Spirit so that you can be Does that make sense? You're, you are like you dwell with the Spirit, but you need to be filled with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes control of your life. As I said last week, it's not so much that we get more of Him, it's, it's about Him getting more of us in our lives. That's my prayer desire for each one of you. I don't know if you saw it, but. And that's my prayer for each one of us that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your precious word and your scripture that you opened to us this morning as we look at Jesus' own life, the example of what a spirit-filled believer should look like. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you change us, transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we, we just want to be available and we want to surrender our lives to your work in us. Help us, Lord, to, to be, be what you want us to be, to live lives pleasing to you. Lord, as we as church have a, have a task to go out and make disciples of all nations, we need the power of the Spirit. To con we need the Holy Spirit to convict people. It's not our words. It's not by what we say and the arguments we use. It's but the Spirit of God working in people's lives. Convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when people respond to that, that you will work in them and give them new life. I pray, Lord, that we will just be that instrument through which you can work and through which you can do many things. Lord, thank you for also the help of the comforter that gives us the strength when we need it, when we are tempted, when we are weak, Lord, that the Spirit of God will give us the strength we need. And I pray that this morning, that if there's any person in this building that knows he's struggling with sin in, in his life or her life, that you will give them the ability and the strength to overcome. Thank you for your word, also leading and guiding us in all matters of faith and life, and that you have given us, your divine power has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Thank you for that. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.